All right. Good morning, New Life Manitou. All right. My name is Taylor Stanton. I'm a volunteer here, and I'm going to do some scripture reading. Would you guys stand for the scripture reading? Um, today's reading is from 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 16. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the woman came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing his lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns, and everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Stay standing, if you would, as we pray. Lord, would you lead us far, far away from jealousy? Lead us into serving like you served us. Lord, you are the the great model of what it is to be a servant, to go to the cross, die for us. Lord, remind us of that today. Lord, we pray this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people shouted, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we were right here talking about, do you remember? Do you remember last sermon? It's a week ago. David and Goliath, this mountaintop experience of David killing this giant, this wonderful mountaintop experience is now, this week, this low, low valley where David is about to get the wrath of Saul and all his jealousy. David kills Goliath. I'm sure back then, I'm not sure if they had Facebook or Twitter, I don't know, uh, but I'm sure it was blowing up. Hashtag success, hashtag next king, hashtag David is awesome. I'm sure it was just blowing up. And Saul responds to this uh, fame of David's by absolute jealousy. He responds horribly, and we are going to look at that today. And then later in the sermon, we are going to look at Saul, or excuse me, that's Saul's response. Later, we are going to look at Jonathan's response. He is Saul's son, and he responds wonderfully. He's going to see the, the, the blessing that is on David's life. He is going to um, come to David and, and give him what David is, is rightfully his, like the throne that God has given to him, and Jonathan is going to be a type, a shadow of Jesus. And so today in this sermon, two points. The first one is to talk about jealousy. The second is to talk about how we overcome jealousy, and it will ultimately lead us to the cross, who Jesus is as he served, and will ultimately lead us this morning to the table. Cool beans? Cool beans. Cool beans. beans. All right. Point number one is this. Jealousy leads to a prison of sin. Jealousy leads to a prison of sin. I think we're going to talk about jealousy this morning, and it is a sin, and it leads to a prison of sin. And what, I imagine uh, certain sins, we could start talking about certain sins, and those of you in here could probably look around and say, you know what, I don't, I don't, Pat yourself on the back. I don't struggle with this one or that one. We could name certain sins and you could kind of just get a smile on your face and say, you know, I'm okay on that one. 
Jealousy is not that. No one gets a pass this morning. No one can say, you can't leave here today and say, well, you know, Joe sometimes rattles off things in his sermons and he just doesn't connect with the people. No, this is going to connect. It's everyone in here. You can't leave today and say, yeah, I just don't get fed. His sermons are talking about stuff I have no, I've never struggled with jealousy. Baloney. We all do. It is a part of the human condition. We struggle with jealousy. It is a big, big deal. It's something we struggle with early on in our lives. You look at kids, even little babies, and there's jealousy amongst them. I have uh, four little boys. A couple weeks ago, uh, Theo is one, Max is three. They're playing in the living room, and all of a sudden, Max stands up and says, Dad, Look how strong I am. And he flexes it. He's got a really weird flexing stance. You should ask him. Max is the curly-headed one. Ask him, Max, let me see your muscles. And he does like this kind of thing. <laughs> like, he, he's like a weird little, like he locks up his body and stares cross-eyed at his bicep. And I just said, Max, wow, you are so strong, Max. You're the, and he really is strong. You're the strongest three-year-old I know. He's got to keep up with some older brothers. So it's like, wow, Max, you are so strong. I'm just going, oh, look at that bicep. Look at your flexing, Max. I'm just you know, building up. The little boys need to know that they're strong. And Theo is next to him. Theo just kind of looks over at Max. He's, now mind you, he's only one year old. Like this is, he's very little. This is, this is a couple weeks ago. And Theo stands up, walks over to Max and just whoop, punches him in the stomach <laughs> and goes back to his toys and starts playing. And Max is like, Theo, why'd you do that, Theo? Theo, why'd you punch me, Theo? Theo, why would you do that? And he couldn't understand why Theo would just get up and punch him. But as the dad, of course, we all know what was going on. He was jealous. Like I was, I was complimenting Max and going on and on about how strong Max is. And Theo heard that as a little one-year-old. He's he's two now. So this happened a couple weeks ago. He's he's over that now. But I mean, this story is a it's a cute little story. And it's but it's it's I mean, if we're to look at it and call it what it is, it's jealous rage that is inside of. I know, I know. You're smiling. It's it's a one-year-old, and and he's two now, so he's over that. But this is. This is inside of all of us, even at a very young age, and it is, uh, I I feel like like we're at odds in our culture and our world today, and just calling jealousy what it is, and it is a sin. It is a prison, and it leads to sin, and it is, in fact, sin, and I feel at odds with our world around us that just has no problem with jealousy. It's like, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with, well, it's Everything is wrong with it. In fact, philosophers today, if I, say the, I said the name of this uh, philosopher, I think most of you would probably recognize him. He's an atheist, and he, he kind of makes a living uh, as an atheist, as a philosopher. And even he says this, you know, right down, getting down to it, he says, envy is the most potent cause for unhappiness. He's looking at the world, and, and, and it, I guess for him as an atheist, the highest thing is, is happiness here and now and on this earth. And he says, envy is not right. It, it is the most potent cause of unhappiness. And then if you bring into it the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, of course, jealousy, uh, envy is one of the seven deadly sins. There's not a list in the Bible of the seven deadly sins. It's the church, the, 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 the desert fathers, the church fathers that came up with this list. It's like, here's the list of the most dangerous things. There's all kinds of sins, but these are the most dangerous, the most deadly, and smack dab in the middle of this list of seven is envy. Of course, we know the Ten Commandments. That is a list that's in the Bible. In Exodus, lists all these commands. And the tenth one, the hardest one, do you know it, is do not covet. Good. Do not covet. And what is coveting? What is jealousy? What is envy? Today, I'm going to talk about them all as, as one thing. This, this thing, when we look at someone else and we want either what they have, like a physical thing, or we want their status, or we want something that they have. Consider this, the, the sins of our, uh, as recorded in the Bible, the very first sin of the Bible, Adam and Eve, are, are people who are just told, Enjoy the garden, but just don't do this one thing. Just don't eat of this fruit because then your eyes will be opened and, and you, it'll lead to death. And what the, the, the sin that they commit is disobedience to God. They take what they shouldn't. But in the, 
in the, at the core of this, it seems like the sin is really wanting what they do not have. They want this knowledge. They want something that God told them not to. They're envious, they're jealous, and they take this fruit and they eat of it. The very first murder, murder in the Bible, Cain and Abel, you know this story, Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel. It seems like everything's going pretty well for these brothers. They're sacrificing to God. Cain gives of the field. Abel gives of the uh, the livestock, and God, it says, has favor on Abel and his offering, and on Cain and his offering, he didn't have as much favor. We don't know too much more about the details of it than that, but what does Cain do? He is filled with this rage, this jealous rage, and he says, brother, let's go out into the field, and there he kills his own brother, and at the core of this is jealousy. Jealousy left unchecked, we'll see today, turns into rage, and it turns into murder, and it is horrible, horrible sin. It is one of the worst sins, according to Scripture. And how can that be? I think our culture is really at odds. Like, we, we make such a big deal. Uh, I think our world is, is one that, that we just kind of brag about our, what we do, our accomplishments. We use social media to uh, self-platform, and then all of us jokers, we get on Facebook and, and social media, and we see how everyone else's life is better than ours. They have this, they have that. Look at how perfect this is and that is, and look at this, and we are filled with jealousy. And I think our world, the, the society we live in today says, what's wrong with that? Like, is that so wrong? Yes, it is. Look at Proverbs 27, 4. Uh, every night we read scripture in our house uh, with our boys, and this week we're in the Proverbs, and the boys really liked all these little sayings. In fact, this week they said, Dad, uh, read another chapter, would you? And of course, I did. I thought in my head, like, how many times in life are your, your sons, your, your children going to ask you, read another scripture, Dad? Um, and so we did. We got into Proverbs 27, and I read this verse, and I thought, let's talk about this, because we're going to talk about jealousy in church. I wanted to know what they thought. It says this, Proverbs 27, 4, wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy. It's kind of a, this question. No one, no one can. Jealousy is a monster. And I asked the boys, oh, what is jealousy? Well, it's when you want something that someone else has. And I said, yeah, it's either, you know, something they have or their status. Dad, what status? It's like, well, it's what people think about you. You know, there's, there, there's social status. We talked about that. It's like, yeah, I get it. The, the kids get it. The jealousy is not right because at the core of it is not thanking God for what you do have, not enjoying what you actually do have from God. And it's at the core of it is comparing. I wrote down this definition a very simple one. Jealousy is a belief that God has not blessed us as we deserve. Very simple definition. Um, Jealousy is a belief that God has not blessed us as we think we deserve. So all that was just an intro into 1 Samuel 18. Let's turn to it. Let's look at it. Let's look at Saul here in verse 6. It says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, we talked about that last week, the woman came out from all the towns. Where'd they come out from? All the towns. Wow, what a party. The women came out from all the towns of Israel, excuse me, and to meet, who'd they come out to meet? King Saul. They came out to meet King Saul. Imagine this day in King Saul's life. Should be awesome. Should be great. Uh, they came, all, uh, the women came out from all the towns to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, joyful songs and timbrels and lyres. It was a party. Can you imagine this party? Uh, the only thing I could think of that, that, that would even closely resemble this is um, when the Broncos, Lord help them, they've had a couple uh, bad seasons. We know that. I apologize. Sorry for bringing that up. Um, but a couple years ago, 2016, you remember, that was a great year. Peyton Manning was playing. They went to the Super Bowl. They won, and a couple of days after the Super Bowl, there was a party in downtown Denver, and paraded through the streets was Peyton Manning, like a king, and everybody's like, wow, this is awesome, we won. It's like, we, like, what did we do? They won, but, but we won, we're awesome. And that's the only thing I can compare. Like, this must have been quite the scene. Women from 
all the towns coming out to greet King Saul. Um, and, and women in the ancient world, in the ancient culture, usually didn't come out. They were expected to be, you know, be at home, be taking care of things. And, and here, it, it was such a grand party that women from all the towns came out with instruments, singing and dancing. Verse 7, as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands. Saul has slain his thousands. Saul has slain. And they're dancing and there's, there's stringed instruments and there's uh, like, like timbrels, whatever that is, like the, these cymbal things. And it was a party in the streets. Saul is walking by. It should have been the highlight of his life, a highlight of his, his, his uh, career as king. They're singing, they're dancing. Imagine you coming home on like a great day. You just had a great day the best day of work ever. You got a raise, you made the sales, it's your birthday too, and you come home and you're driving up your driveway and Sarah and the band and Tyler's like playing drums up your driveway, just <laughs> cheering and, and they're praising God and they're singing, your name is awesome, you're great, your birthday. This is, it would be a highlight, right? Of anyone's life, anyone's career, it would be awesome. And what does Saul think? Well, there's another line to this song. Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And this becomes a song. This becomes, uh, I'm not sure if they had um, like CDs and albums back then and iTunes, but, but this would be a wow hits of whatever, 20, 1020 BC, the wow hits. This, this became quite the song. And I say that as a joke, but in a couple chapters from now, uh, David will be in another town in Gath outside uh, of this area. And the person that he meets says, hey, aren't you the David they sing about in the song? Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. So this song blew up. It became a best hit. It really did. It goes out and Saul cannot hear anything but the David part. And he immediately starts comparing himself to David, David killing his thousands. And if, he, if he's seeing this with a sober mind, like he saw, he's the king, and if he's seeing this with any kind of like, like, uh, like the career of being a king, then he should say, well, David, this, this great warrior is on our side. This great warrior is, is someone who has just killed a bunch of people and has uh, brought in this, uh, this kingdom and he's doing great. That's good for the kingdom, right? I mean, Saul, he has David. David's doing great. The kingdom's doing great. He should be happy. But instead, he is unable to enjoy the success of another person. He is competing. He's comparing. He should stop and just say thank you to David. He should realize what he has, that this is actually a great thing for him and the whole kingdom, but instead he cannot. We can point to Saul and say, Saul is a cotton-headed ninny-muggin, and he's silly, and it's Saul is just Saul. But isn't this in all of us? Isn't there this beginning of jealousy is comparison? And don't we all do that? Here, let's continue. Verse 8 says this. Saul's very angry. This refrain, this song displeased him greatly. They credit David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me only with thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. And then this verse, the next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul, which is kind of, doesn't that like great your ears? Like, wait, what? Like God sent the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. So God's spirit isn't evil, but a part of this judgment upon Saul, and he is falling away from God and running further and further and further from the things of God. Part of that is this spirit of God, this evil spirit sent by Saul, and it torments him. And, and another way of translating this is an evil mood or a bad mood upon Saul, and it is a part of the judgment of God upon Saul. Modern readers read this and throw out terms like, well, maybe Paul was suffering with uh, paranoid schizophrenia, maybe he was just homicidal, obsessive, bipolar. These are all theories, these are all words that modern day readers look into this text. But here's one thing we know for sure, Saul goes 
absolutely berserk. We see for years and years and years, maybe 15 uh, or so years, this jealous rage between Saul and what he has towards David. Here's the, here's the beginnings of it. Uh, continuing on, it says, he was prophesying in his house. This is going to be a weird scene, by the way. David was playing a lyre, like a stringed instrument, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, which is just a weird scene, right? Like Saul's in his house, David's over playing music, and and this was a part of uh, like Saul would get these mad rages and David would come over and play music and this would calm him. But for some reason he had a spear in his hand, which I don't know. Yesterday I was listening to some music, Yo-Yo Ma's 2007 album, Best Hits, and I had a spear in my hand. Is that weird? Is that un- is that frowned upon? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, this this scene is a little weird. Like he's listening to music with a spear in hand and then this. Like he says to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. You know what that means? Like this me- like he's going to murder David right here in his own house. I'll pin David to the wall throwing a spear at him, but David eluded him twice. Like this is a bad scene. Like this is in his own house. He tries to murder David. And imagine what this would have done to to him and his career. Like David, he kills this hero. Like this, this is bad. This is really bad. David will go on and write some Psalms. We know David is this great Psalmist and he will write about some of these experiences. If you want to turn, you could look at Psalm 59. David writes about this uh, running and people trying to kill him that were sent from Saul. It starts off uh, Psalm 59. 59, uh, even before verse 1, it says, For the director of music, to the tune of Do Not Destroy, of David and Mictam, when Saul had sent men to watch David's house in order to, in order to kill him. David prays this, Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoer, evildoers and save me from those who are after my blood. Think about this. David is in a horrible place. He is in a valley of death because Saul is now trying to kill him because he is so jealous. Saul is so jealous of David. And what did David do? I mean, he's out in his father's uh, field, Jesse's field, taking care of his dad's sheep. And Samuel, the prophet, comes over, surprises David, anoints him as king. David goes into battle just to visit his brothers, learns about this Goliath character, steps up with courage, ends up killing this giant. And then all um, just hell breaks loose in his life when Saul the king wants him dead. This is a hard place, a horrible place for David, being at the end of Saul's spear because of all the jealousy. Jealousy, once again, is the belief that God has not blessed us as we think we have deserved. So as I go to point two here, what are we to do? If we, kind of, if we do admit that jealousy is not right, if jealousy does begin with comparison, and, and we are certainly all guilty of this, well then what do we do? What do we do instead? Point number two is this, that serving, serving overcomes jealousy. Serving. When we serve, when we willingly lay down our, ourselves, our lives, what we have for the sake of others, this is the opposite of jealousy. Serving overcomes jealousy. And we're going to look specifically at Jonathan. Do you know who Jonathan is? He is Saul's son. He's Saul's oldest son. And Israel is new to this whole king thing, but certainly they knew how it worked from all the other monarchies and things around. And usually when a king dies, who gets to become the next king? The son, the oldest son. And who is Jonathan? The oldest son. So if anyone in the story, kind of thinking through this story and the people, so Saul's the king, the next king should probably be Jonathan. And if anyone here has really a, a reason to be jealous, uh, the, the, no one is uh, right in jealousy, but if anyone kind of had the most excuse to be jealous, it would probably be Jonathan. He's the one that is the next king to be. He is the one, like David, did this great battle. If you remember a couple weeks ago, remember Jonathan and the armor bearer? Do you remember that? How many of you were here when we talked about that? my new favorite character? I said, the armor bearer just goes with Jonathan. They climb up a wall. And, and kill a garrison of Philistines, and it's this huge victory, and then Israel wins that battle. Jonathan, 
He's, he's, he's like a David. And I'm going to argue that he is like a, a model, a type of Jesus he, in what he does. Let's look at the scripture here. 1 Samuel 18, it's this interaction between David and Jonathan. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. And he loved him as himself, which is what we're all called to do. We're called to love others as ourselves. Sounds like what Jesus would say in the New Testament. Um, verse 2 says this, From that day Saul kept an eye uh, with him and did not let him return to his family. So David becomes kind of part of the family uh, with Jonathan and other, other people there. Verse 3 says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Uh, Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David which is a symbol of uh, a king or a prince taking off what is rightfully theirs, laying it down so that someone else could pick it up. I think of the image in the New Testament. Jesus will talk about the prodigal son. The son comes home after living uh, a horrible life and partying and throwing his father's inheritance away, comes back, and what does the father go out to meet the son with? A robe, a ring and a robe, a robe, like this mantle of, yes, here is what is yours. So Saul, uh, excuse me, Jonathan gives to David what is Jonathan's. Like he has this mantle of leadership. He is supposed to be the next king, and here he is giving it to David. And then it says this, and then gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So not only is he giving him his robe saying, you're the next king, not me. He's naming it. Like I think a lot of times in, in life, when we hit like confrontation head on, many of us like to just, just kind of not talk about it and sweep it under the rug. Here is the right thing being done. Jonathan names it. He goes right to it and says, here, let's, let's talk about this because you are the next king. You are the holy one, the chosen one. You are the anointed one of God. Here, you're the next king. Here's the robe. And he even gives him his weapons saying, you're not just the next king, but you're my king. Like I am fully laying down even my weapons before you. And this is, the, this is how we should respond to the Lord and to the Lord's um, choosing and what the Lord, who he decides to bless. It's a very different response than Saul's response. You know, in, in thinking through this, uh, this week, I've just been reminded of how much Jonathan is like a Christ-like figure to a shadow, a type of uh, one who will be Jesus. Jesus comes uh, 1,000, 2,000 years after Jonathan. And what does Jesus do? There's this scene in the New Testament, right, where Jesus takes off his outer garment, kneels down, and then washes his disciples' feet. Do you know this image? And, and the disciples are thrown off by that. They're like, no, no, you can't serve us. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Holy One. You're God himself is what we believe, Jesus. And, and you can't wash our feet. And then Jesus, no, I have to do this. I have to serve you. I have to do this. This is my work. This is a part of the kingdom. And ultimately, that is fulfilled when Jesus goes to the cross. He dies on the cross for our sins. He has to do this. He serves us so that we can serve, so that we can be a blessing, so that we can receive forgiveness and, and, and see Jesus' humility. Jesus is a newer, a better Jonathan. Jesus is the one who does not dodge, you know, thinking about this image. Saul throws a spear at David. David dodges it. We, as humanity, um, we're, we're given the weapons. Jesus comes to us. God himself comes to us. The weapons are laid down. And what do we do? We pick up the weapons and we kill Jesus on a cross. Jesus does not uh, elude the spear, whereas Jesus actually receives it. He receives the death that we deserve. His death on the cross covers us of our sin. So as we think about this sermon, as I, as I wrap up here this morning, I think we need to come, and, and I think the, the response we all need to do is to say we, we need to repent. We, we're all guilty of jealousy. We're all guilty of, of not serving would you stand with me and, and I'm going to invite you to, to bow your head and to figuratively look Jesus in the eyes this morning. The band can come up and we're going to prepare for the table. I'm going to read a scripture um, of, uh, this is Philippians 2. This is how we are to be because this is how Jesus was for us. I want you to consider these words. Consider this uh, Jesus being the ultimate one who served, even though his, uh, he was God himself. 
He was the king. He was, he's the Lord. It says this, Philippians 2, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who? So be like Jesus. Verse 6, who being in the very nature God, did, did not consider equality with God something to his own advantage. Rather, he himself became nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So Lord, this morning as we lay down our lives before you, as we look into your eyes, Lord, as we figuratively face you, Lord, and, and are looking at the cross saying, thank you, Lord, that you have died on the cross, that you've taken away our sin, though we are, Lord, filled with jealousy, and though we are sinners, you come to us, Lord. You fill us with your spirit. You take away our sin so that we might be close to you, so that we might serve others, so that we might be a mirror of who you are, your goodness, your righteousness here on this earth. So, Lord, we praise you. We welcome you and your work inside of us, Lord.